بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه إلى يوم الدين However little our Islamic knowledge, we all know that this uh, principle of unity and dispersion is at the heart of really everything that we believe in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world uh, with various oppositions in it. There is up and down and there is good and evil and there is light and there is dark. That's the way he's made it. One of these fundamental differences, it seems to me, is the difference between the one and the many. And when we look at the seerah of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and at the topic for this evening, we see exactly what it was that he did for his people, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the psychological as well as the social revolution which he left behind him when he went to join his Lord. Tawheed however uh, little our Islamic knowledge might be, is the one indispensable truth. The one, the affirming the one. When we turn within ourselves, we find too many things. Our emotions are many, our impulses are many, our daydreams are many, our sins are many. They jump around, each with their own demands and burden, and we seek peace, we seek uh, a healing and a release from that, and we'll only find it in the one the one source, the one place of origin, the point of return, that which gives sense and proportion and balance to everything else. That's in the soul, only with the remembrance of the one, tatma innul qulub, do the hearts find peace and serenity, which is what, I guess, every single human being craves. And it's the same, of course, in society. So many individuals and special interests uh, jumping around, pulling society in different directions, and we become sick outwardly just as we're sick inwardly when the many prevail. Only the one, the one legislator, the one source of values, the one guarantor of meaning, the one ground of everything can help to suppress those jumping voices and help them to come together. Tawheed is not just uh, the declaration of the divine unity, but is the way in which society itself can find balance and proportion and stillness and peace. This is something that we all know, and we see it in the seerah of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Behind the outward show of the destruction of the 360 idols around the Kaaba, there was the reality of the destruction of the idols in the souls of Quraysh, and their uh, turning towards the Kaaba, the symbol of Al-Wahid, Al-Qahar. That was what the Sira did, the accomplishment of the abolition of the false gods of the many and the re-establishment of the one god of Sayyidina Ibrahim, Khalilullah, alayhi salam. And again, you don't have to know much about Islam to know that the opposition to this principle of the one is shirk, the many we express as shirk. That is to say, suggesting that as well as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are other sources of, of authentic value and strength and autonomy out there in the cosmos. That there is a rival, a partner, something that challenges the authority of al-Wahid al-Qahar. And the ulama have listed so many different forms of shirk, warning us against it, because after all, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ketaba ala nafsihi rahma he has inscribed mercy upon his own nature, he has indicated that this particular failing is not to be forgiven. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. Allah does not forgive that there should be any impartnered unto him, but he forgives anything less than that to whomsoever he wills. This is the one unforgivable sin to say that Behind the many that we see, there is another bunch of many things. Or alternatively, to say that behind the many that we see, there is just a void and nothing at all, and the mystery of the many coming from nothingness is a puzzle, but there are people whose souls 
are dark enough to be inclined towards that paradox as well. But no, we say behind the many, there is the one, all else is madness. And that madness is the nature of idolatry. Whether or not it takes the form of crude bowing down to crude statues, or whether it takes the form of bowing down to any other real rival to the authority and sovereign unique rights of our creator is not really the point. There are many kinds of shirk, and the ulama have indicated, at least my teachers used to say, that there are two kinds of shirk that in our age seem to be particularly pestilential. Uh, and we might as well briefly indicate what they are, because I think there is a sobering lesson for us. We're not just talking about statues of wood and stone, we are talking about ongoing dark realities that compromise our tawheed. And these two are shirk al-ihtisab and shirk al-asbab. Shirk al-ihtisab means the shirk that happens when, because of our desire to please somebody who is not our creator, or because of our fear of somebody who is not our creator, we do things that seem to be ostensibly religious. So if we're in the masjid, and there's somebody who we think we might get some benefit out of watching us, and our prayer as a result becomes a little bit longer, we have split the qibla. We have two qiblas, and that is a form of shirk. That is ostentation, a shirk al asghar the lesser shirk, as the Holy Prophet والسلام, described it. And that is a catastrophe if shirk is the thing that is not to be forgiven. And nowadays there are some who believe that it is not just through hope but through fear that people are to be constrained into Islam. The one who barks at the poor sister whose hijab isn't quite right and she adjusts her hijab not 100% to please her Lord, but to stop that man barking. He has imposed a kind of shirk upon her, potentially. Her qibla is split. She is doing it not just for fear of her Lord, but for fear of that man who is barking at her. That also is a lethal compromise in our tawheed. The one with the large stick and the angry face, which is to beat people because they're not complying with some ruling of sharia, needs to think about the implications for people's tawheed of what he is doing. What if now they go to the masjid, or they fast, or they do some other good work, not just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or maybe not at all for him, but simply because they don't want to feel those blows raining on their head. What has happened to that tawheed? And nowadays there are many Muslims who think that because of the political dimensions of religion, you have to use that stick to force people into paradise, dragging them to heaven by the scruff of their neck, as it were, a very strange conception. What are they doing to the tawheed of those people? In the longer term, they will find that they have no tawheed at all. So that's shirk al-ihtisab, which the scholars say seems to be a particular risk in our fragile and spiritually ignorant times. And the second is shirk al-asbab, the polytheism of causes. We believe in uh, an all-powerful deity, an all-knowing deity. No leaf falls, but that it is known to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us and what we do. There is no other genuine agent out there in creation. He alone does things and this staggers the imagination. We cannot imagine such a being or what the world is really like if we don't accept that there are causes. But we know in our theology that this is real. Everything that happens is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing. There is nobody who can rival him. He does not step back from certain possibilities in creation, limit himself, chain himself. That is not possible. So shirk al-asbab is the idea that things are out of control. Things cause other things according to certain laws or rules. And this causes, again, a kind of shirk type anxiety in the human soul. People feel frightened because the world seems to be out of control. What if, what if, what if, and the believer is not like that. The believer has tawakkul and knows that whatever afflicts him is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever blessing comes to him is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He believes in al-qadri khayrihi wa sharri. He believes in destiny, it's good and it's evil, or it's good and it's bitter, the bitter and the sweet of it. And this is the essence of what it is to be Muslim, surrendered, accepting how things are. That behind the outward show, the scenery of cause and effect, there is the reality of the total unopposed divine control. And when we have that, tawakkul comes and again the healing ensues. And this at least used to be one of the great gifts of the Muslim. 
Now, if we overcome these two forms of shirk and look at the world in this serene and knowing way, seeing behind the infinitesimally thin surface of things to the reality of the divine power and glory and mercy, knowing that there is nothing really out there that is not simply an expression of the free and unopposed interplay of Allah's names in every instant, whether it be names of beauty or names of rigor, it is all what he is doing and what he is intending. Everything in that sense is absolutely and utterly holy. When we have this, our hearts turn because we perceive him not as a God of absence, but as a God who is absolutely present. This is the ma'iyya. Huwa ma'akum. The Quran says, he is with you. And this is his name, Al-Qarib, which is a name we've almost forgotten. Many of the divine names in the Quran again come in pairs. Al-Muhi, Al-Mumit, the one who gives life, the one who gives death. Al-Khafid, Al-Rafi'ah the one who lowers, the one who raises up, and so on. But there is no name that stands as a complement to the name Al-Qarib, the near. He is never referred to as the distant. Now, we are distant in our forms of idolatry. Hmm? What happens at the end of the stories of the idolaters in the Qur'an, often we have this idea of distance, بُعْدًا لِلْقَوْمِ zalimin distant or distant to the people of injustice. This was the people of Nur and so on. But Al-Ba'id is never one of the divine names. Where is he? Close. What does it mean to be close if we're not speaking about geographical distance or being close to us in time? What other kind of closeness could there possibly be? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is close. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my slaves ask concerning me, say, I am near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَان I respond to the prayer of the supplicant when he calls upon me. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Let them respond to me and let them have trust in me that perhaps they will receive guidance. It's a famous ayah. فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ He is proclaiming that he is near. When we have this transformation in the souls, so we don't just see the world as a kind of piece of clockwork with laws producing effects, but see the divine hand and wisdom and beauty and majesty and rigor in everything, then he becomes قَرِيب to us in our perception as well as قَرِيب in the reality of creation. And this is the state to which every believer must aspire. It is here that Tawheed becomes not just something that we pay lip service to, but becomes a reality that di dictates our form of being. All too often believers in today's world mouth a whole load of doctrines, but the hearts are still full of anxiety, as if the world has slipped out of control, as if Al-Wahid Al-Qahar is no longer running things, but some other strange thing has taken over the world and it's run away. This is not the case. The world is simply the outworking of his pre-existent decree in his wisdom. And the believer must know this. When he sees this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-qarib, truly qarib for that person. We're invited to make this journey from perceiving Allah as a kind of abstract theological other to unlike anything in the world really to be open of access and towards one to whom we can relate and pray. Remember the beautiful ayah uh, that it's uh, يرشدون, that perhaps they will receive guidance. We find this built into the logic of the Fatiha itself. Mm. Every Muslim knows the Fatiha. Every Muslim has to say the Fatiha. It's the only obligatory thing in the prayer, really, the an obligatory recitation. And what happens halfway through the Fatiha? Well, it's an amazing document. It's short. Allah is merciful. This is the obligation, and it's a short obligation. But since we're going to say it maybe tens of thousands of times in our, in our lives, we might as well think about it from time to time. What is it that we are saying? What is so mem momentous about these few words? Probably most of you will have realized that it consists of two parts. The first part 
Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, it's a declaration of the need or the, the natural way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praise belongs to him. And then it gives him some qualities. Ar-Rahman rahim Maliki Yawmiddin. This is all in what the Arabs call Dhamir al-Ghaib, which is the pronoun of absence, the third person singular in English. Absent, the third person. And you can use the third person of somebody who's standing next to you or somebody who's on the moon. It's still grammatically valid. But then, halfway through the surah, amazingly, we switch to the second person in a very emphatic clap of thunder. <laughs> Suddenly, you alone we worship, and from you alone do we seek help. It turns from an expression of hamd into an expression of dua. Halfway through, unexpectedly, we are not speaking of the absent, but addressing the one who is present. That's what you do when you're speaking in the second person singular. It becomes a prayer. And this is where religion leaves the, the, the abstract wastes of the mind and enters the living reality of our human hearts. He becomes qarib, he becomes close when we speak to him. Let them respond to me. Not just by writing some abstract theological treatise of the relationship between the attributes and the essence, but responding in our humble, broken humanity to the absolute presence of Al Qarib, recognizing how near he is. He is closer to man than the jugular vein. That's how close he is. And we are ordered to be close. This is one of the orders that came to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and is connected again to the act of prayer. Wasjud waqtarib, prostrate and draw near. And the hadith tells us that the aqrabu ma yakunu abdu min rabbi, the closest, the nearest, the most qareeb that the slave is to his Lord is wa huwa sajid, when he is prostrate. And that's the climax of the prayer, therefore the climax of the believer's life. It is to affirm that he is near. It is to affirm that he is near. And this is the reality of religion. The reality of religion is to weep during the prayer, to feel that extraordinary moment when one is aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not come, he does not come and go, but is present, his ma'iyah, his unimpeded operation of his magnificent, endlessly beautiful, coruscating, luminous names all around us, within us, around us. There has never been anything else. And that is the way the true believer sees things. And it's difficult because we're human beings and we have that animal impulse that sees cause and effect and we have that, those reflexes. Hard, really, to take that theology into the heart and to make it our living principle. Animals don't have it. The cat knows that there is causality. It rains, the cat feels wet, can't understand al qarib not really. But human beings, we have this capacity through the mystery that the Fatiha invites us to of moving from that abstract world of the distant to the living reality of the one who is present. And there's no better way of discovering this than looking at the many du'as, the prayers that the Holy Prophet وسلم, has bequeathed to us in the beautiful sunnah. If you really want to understand Islam, I always tell people, look at the prayers of the Holy Prophet. That will tell you more than a thousand volumes of theology. Prayer is where you can see the, the reality of faith, the humility of the human soul, the glory of the human being as it discovers tawheed. And what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequence, and again my teachers have always insisted on this, is that where you see al qarib and you internalize that, you start to love creation. You really start to love creation. Of course, there's scary stuff out there. The divine names are sometimes rigorous, and looking through the Hubble Space Telescope shows you how much scary stuff and awesome stuff and magnificence there is out there in creation. Uh, but it is all his, and it is all to be loved. The sign of true faith is the uh, upswelling of love from the heart, so that you see Allah's creation, not just as a bunch of phenomena 
concatenations of DNA and atomic particles seem to be swept away and reconfigured in an essentially meaningless material universe, but is what Allah wishes in that moment, and he is ahkam al-hakimin. That's the transformation between those who know and those who do not know, and it's a huge difference. They're not the same types of human being. And what is the consequence of this? The consequence is that the one who sees Allah as al-qarib loves his creation and loves human beings more than anything else in creation because it is in the human beings that these extraordinary qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are not just about beauty and majesty but are moral as well can be manifest. You can see the mercy in human beings, the, the justice in human beings, the mildness in human beings and if they don't have all of those qualities now you can at least see their receptivity to those things. Love them for what they are or for what they are called to become but love them and this has always been the way of my teachers an extraordinary compassionate regard of love for Allah's creatures including the sinful amongst them and this has always been the mark of the awliya and the great scholars of Islam human beings are what is intended by creation and that's not a little thing remember that story by which in a sense our predicament or our situation began in Surah Al-Baqarah. Extraordinary episode, coming towards the beginning of this last great magnificent testament to Tawheed, uncompromising Abrahamic monotheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right at the beginning of the human story, orders the angels to bow down to this creature that is just made of clay. What a strange text to have in a document that is about to smash the idols of, of the Arabs and reduce humanity to the status of Abd. The angels themselves, with their closeness to Allah, al malaikat al muqarrabun ordered to bow down to this strange being that has been created of clay. And they do it, except, of course, Iblis does not do it. And that is our choice. Either we can recognize the infinite dignity and lovability and adorability of human beings, not because of what we are, just a kind of bundle of, of cells and organs and particles, not very pretty after a while, but because of the light of the soul, the ruh, that Allah has created in this clay. Either we can love them and really love them and see them with a loving eye, or we can follow the way of Iblis and just refuse to respect, refuse to adore. Why? because of his pride, because of his logic, uh, because of his false theology, his incorrect deduction. I'm better than him. I'm a fire. But fire is from our own autonomy, from our own inward energies, from anger, from wrath, from pride. Too much of that in religion today. Too little love for Allah's servants because there's too much pride, anger, confusion, arrogance. So these are just some of the consequences of Tawheed. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ left his people, having been divided into tribes following different statues and feuding for century after century after century, uniting their hearts because of this wonderful, transformative, unique and uniquely irreplaceable principle of Tawheed, of the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of us speak of Tawheed nowadays sometimes angrily, sometimes softly. But Tawheed is nothing if it remains just in the brain and in the theological manuals and doesn't enter the heart and doesn't transform the way that we are. Tawheed should help us not just to affirm the unity of the Creator, but to help us to remember the, uni the unity of the human race as well. Everybody is either Ummat al-Da'wah or Ummat al-Ijabah. Everybody has either been, is either to be called or has responded, but they were all there, as it were, at the time when the angels bowed down to Adam, alayhi salam. They all have that karramna bani Adam, we've ennobled the descendants of Adam. They all have the ismat al-adamiyya, as the Maturidi scholars refer to it, the inviolability of belonging to the Adamic family. This is the true consequence of Tawheed. Pay no attention to disrespect, mistrust those who talk about Tawheed but whose hearts are not overflowing with love for Allah's creatures. Barakallahu feekum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.